Howdy, and welcome to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. The Preaching Poetry Podcast uses poetry to inspire conversation and to rediscover the world. Let's get to it. Howdy, y'all. The poem we're reading today is called Opportunity by Edward R. Sill. So the first thing I'm going to do is read this poem. This I beheld, or dreamed it in a dream. There spread a cloud of dust along a plain, and underneath the cloud, or in it, raged a furious battle, and men yelled, and swords shocked upon swords and shields. A prince's banner wavered, then staggered backward, hemmed by foes. A craven hung along the battle's edge, and thought, Had I a sword of keener steel, that blue blade that the king's son bears, but but this blunt thing? He snapped and flung it from his hand, and lowering, crept away and left the field. Then came the king's son, wounded, sore bestead, and weaponless, and saw the broken sword, hilt buried in the dry and trodden sand, and ran and snatched it, and with battle shout, lifted afresh, he hewed his enemy down, and saved a great cause that heroic day. Hey, I really love this poem, and I wanted to make it the starting poem, because it's it's really more of a story than a poem. And and it's kind of like a fable. It's kind of a morality tale, right? So it's a narrative. And we can see that there are a couple of different things we want to pay attention to in a narrative like this. And the first is the setting, right? You got to pay attention to the setting. Where is this happening? And this poem is taking place in and around a battle, right? So this is where you got to use your imagination a little bit in poetry. So I want you to imagine the Lord of the Rings, right? And uh, you're, you've got the, uh, the, the forces of good on one side and all of the goblins and the orcs on the other side. And, you know, they're fighting against each other. And it's this sort of, uh, you know, an older time, a, a time when, you know, you had these gallant princes marching off to war. And, you know, not that anything like that ever really happened. But, you know, it, it's got a fairy tale kind of feel to it. And there's two main characters, right? There's a prince, and then there's a craven. Now, the prince is pretty self-explanatory, right? I mean, we all get what a prince is. He's the son of a king. He's in line for the throne, and he's out there leading the battle, right? So the prince is the guy that you actually trust to give command of the army to, Uh, he's probably fighting in the place of his father, who may be old, we we don't know. Um, but if, but if the king is not there in the battle, um, the prince is in command, right? And so we see, we have a prince and then we have the other character called the Craven. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the word, the word Craven is a synonym for coward, So you have two contrasting characters in this story. You have the craven and you have the coward. Or, not the craven and the coward. The prince and the coward. The prince and the craven. Now, this poem is marked by the contrast between the two. Right? So they're two very different people who do two very different things. The prince is at the forefront of the fighting. Like, he is right up there in the middle of the action. Um, He's got a banner, right? And that banner is important because, you know, a banner is how you let your troops know where the commander is and what they're supposed to do. So, you know, if, if the banner goes forward, you march forward. If the banner goes back, you go back. If they wave it a certain way, it tells you to stand your ground and let the enemy come to you or whatever. Banners are the ways that the generals would communicate with their army. All right? So the prince is in the middle. He's in the action. But the craven, oh, the craven is at the edge. He's kind of skulking around at the edge of the fighting, right? He hung along the battle's edge. 
because he's craven, he's a coward, he's not really interested in getting into where the hottest part of the battle is. He's afraid. He's scared. So big differences here. The prince is in the middle of it, jumping into the thick of the danger. The craven or the coward refuses to, to jump into the hardest and heaviest of the fighting. Now, they're also very differently uh, outfitted for war, right? The prince, it seems like, um, has this really awesome sword, and the craven calls it uh, a blue blade. So, you know, the, uh, the prince has this really sharp, really awesome sword. Think like Excalibur or something like that, you know, a really powerful, um, well-crafted sword. And in his hands, it's probably a really good weapon. The Craven doesn't have that. The Craven has a sword that he thinks is blunt. It's not as sharp. It's not as good. Not as high quality. Um, you know, the prince has a banner. The prince has the army. Um, he's in command. The Craven, not so much. Um, generally speaking, you don't put the coward in charge of your army. Generally speaking. And so we see there's some pretty striking similarities and differences between these two. Now they're both in the middle of a battle. They're both under stress. They're both having to fight. They both have swords, um, but they react to them very, very differently. And the Craven leaves. He kind of skulks away, right? He sneaks away and deserts, but the Prince doesn't do that. Um, the Prince is in the middle of the fighting. And in fact, even the Prince is kind of, uh, being driven back. So he, he is not necessarily winning this battle the whole time. And so there, there are some differences, but there are some similarities as well. And so when we look at where these people are, it's important when we look at how they respond to their environment, that's also very, very important. But I think we also need to look at how do they respond to the hardships around them? So, you know, the, the Craven curses his luck, and runs away. You know, he uh, he's busy thinking about what the prince has, not about what he has. Um, and he's very uh, busy comparing the two. Um, and he's justifying in his mind all the reasons why he, you know, this is a setup and it's all against him. And he's he, he was, you know, set to fail from the beginning. But the prince is very different. The prince is not skulking away, trying to curse his luck and justify himself to himself. The prince is wounded. The prince is sore bestead. But he does take advantage of the situation and manages to use even a broken sword to turn the tide of battle. Now, that's kind of a big deal. Now... There's another word in here that I just, I've really never seen used before. Bestead, right? B-E-S-T-E-A-D. Bestead. The prince is wounded and sore bestead. Now, bestead is a word that I've looked for the definition of, and it's kind of hard to figure out. Um, some, like, dictionaries will make it make it look like it's related to, you know, habitation, so... Like, you know, a homestead, bestead would be to set up a home somewhere. That doesn't really seem to fit in the context of this poem at all. Um, but if you look, you can actually find this word in a, a really old um, book um, that's not really commonly used today. So I think that the word kind of comes from Old English. Uh, and the book is actually the uh, the authorized version of the the King James Bible. So the the old King James, you know, sixteen eleven, the one that's four hundred years old. Um, the word bestead is in there in that translation of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and so in Isaiah eight twenty one, if you want to go look that up, you can. But the word bestead probably comes from that uh, verse there, and so. Um, if you look at the context that uh, of, of that verse where that word is used, um, it looks it, it makes it look like the word has to do with suffering, um, dealing with trouble, 
Um, and so when, when we see wounded and sore bestead, it probably means um, bestead in that sense, that he's wounded, that he's hurt, that he's suffering, that he's in pain, um, that he's not doing very well, um, that, you know, he's been set upon by his enemies. And so we see that these two characters are very, very different. You know, the craven was never wounded or sore bestead, and yet he turned tail and ran. The prince, even when things were really, really hard, he kept going. He kept fighting. He kept trying to find a way to turn the thing around. He endured hardship and suffering and continued to look for ways to turn the battle, to turn the tide of battle back uh, to his side. And so I think that when we look at this, you know, if we're going to preach here, if we're going to let poetry preach to us, um, then I think it's pretty clear who we're supposed to emulate in this poem. Which of these characters are we supposed to be like? Are we supposed to be like the craven? No. But I think it's not just important to know that we shouldn't be cowardly and we should be more like the prince. But what does that mean? Why? Why is this important? The craven turns tail and runs. And when you're in a battle, that is the worst thing you can do. Um, losing a battle is one thing, but when, when one side of an army starts to turn around and run, and it's not even a fighting retreat, it's just run, that's when a, a defeat turns into a rout. And in ancient battles, that's when most people died. You know, when you've got a bunch of people with armor and shields and swords running up against other people with armor and shields and swords, and they're just banging into each other and trying to push each other around, you know, that's not when you're the in, in the most danger. You're in the most danger when you turn around and the shield wall breaks apart. You're not as well armored in the back. And so if you turn around and run... Not only are you more susceptible to getting killed, but now there's a hole in the wall. There's a hole in the formation. And if your enemy exploits it, you're putting everybody else at risk too. So if we are going to avoid being like the craven, we've got to recognize that our decisions don't just affect us, but they affect other people around us who are counting on us, who are depending on us. By the same token, you know, the craven looks at his sword, says, it's not good enough. It's just not as awesome as this other person has. Um, I, I can't make this work. I can't do with this. It's not enough. And he breaks it. He breaks it in half and throws it away. You know, instead of looking at what he can do with what he has, he, he squanders the sword that he did have and he breaks it when we look at these two characters we know we're supposed to be like the prince but remember the prince doesn't give up just because it gets hard he doesn't give up just because the sword uh, that he had, the blue blade of keen steel, gets lost. We don't know how it gets lost. Maybe he was fighting somebody and it got knocked out of his hand. Maybe it broke. Maybe, I don't know. But he doesn't have it when we come upon him again in the poem. And instead, he picks up the broken blade that the craven snapped and threw away. And he picks that up and uses that broken down blade to turn the battle around. And see, he's resourceful. He looks around for what he does have, not at what he doesn't have. You know, if we're going to be like the prince, then we should be at the front. We should not be avoiding problems, afraid of our problems, but we should meet them head on. We shouldn't look for excuses for why we can't overcome something. Instead, we should look at what we can do. This is common sense. If you're trying to lose a bunch of weight like I am, okay, if you're trying to lose some weight, you know, you're not going to be able to easily and quickly 
lose 20 or 30 pounds. It isn't going to happen. But you know what you can be in charge of? Taking a walk. That's a small thing. It's a lot easier to take one walk than it is to lose 30 pounds. Do you see what I'm getting at? Instead of focusing on the the big impossible things around us that we can't do, we should be like that prince looking around for what we can do, for what we do have access to. Who knows? We might be able to turn the battle around and win. You see, the difference between the prince and the craven is not birth. It's not that one of them is royal and one of them is, you know, just some random nobody. The difference is in their attitude and their response. Likewise, I think we get to decide who we are, what we're going to do. Our destinies may be difficult to change, but they're not fixed. It's not nature versus nurture. It's juncture. It's both of those things. The prince wasn't successful because he was a prince. He was successful because, yes, he was a prince, but he he made the best of the situations that he found himself in. The craven was never going to become the prince. But again, it's not that he is craven or cowardly by nature. It's not his destiny. He's craven because that's what he chooses to do, because he tosses his broken sword away and leaves the battlefield. So if we're going to let this poem preach to us, I think it's pretty clear that we can say yes and amen to this one. It's pretty easy for me to do anyway. That no matter where you find yourself, how you respond and react is going to be the thing that you can control. You don't get to control whether you're born a prince or whether you're born just a common soldier. But you do get to decide whether you are a coward or not. You do get to decide whether you will break and squander the gifts that you do have or whether you will make the best of whatever situation you find yourself in. You know, it would have been really easy for me to just never really get this podcast off the ground and we wouldn't have this here today. We wouldn't be here talking together. It's really easy for me to say, ah, I don't have the right equipment or I don't have, you know, the best skill or nobody wants to listen to what I have to say. But a poem like this motivates me to look at what can I do? What can I do? What do I have to offer? It doesn't determine success or failure. Not by a long shot. But at the end of the day... All that we are really in control of is how we respond. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be a craven? Are you going to complain about your situation? Squander your gifts? Or are you going to be like that prince? Because, you know, he started the battle off as a prince... But when we look at him in the middle, he is wounded. He's sore bestead. He's come down a lot further than that craven ever did. But in looking in despair, looking even in death itself, having lost all of his advantage, all of his societal privilege, his position, his sword, everything, he turns around and looks for what he has. And he considers it his duty still Even though he's hurt and wounded and oppressed and beaten up, even though he's suffering, it's still his responsibility to take whatever he can, to do whatever he can. And so he rallies his army, and they win a great cause. I think we know who we're supposed to be like. So hey, let's go out there and do that. 
what is the great cause that you could save? What is your battle to fight? I don't know. You'll have to figure that part out for yourself. Anyway, that's our episode. Episode one, done. Thank you guys for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed your time with us, and we look forward to having you back for more. If you like what you heard, please be sure to leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe. If you're looking for more content, you can find us on Apple, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, basically anywhere you find podcasts. If you want to join our community or just want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Preaching Poetry.